in John chapter 14, and uh, I'm going to be there a while. I, I uh, was thinking about this the other day. If if I I'm not driven by the calendar, it, it's it's I. If there's a season of the year that comes up, and a, a lot of churches, a lot of preachers will will shift their message to meet that season. And I, I try not to do that. I, I, uh, I kind of resist. I just want to go verse by verse. I want to plod my way through the Bible. I figure this Thanksgiving, you'll get enough of that without me going on it. And, and besides that, uh, uh, can you imagine how long it would take me to go through the Gospels if I interrupted for every holiday? So I don't like my preaching schedule driven by the holiday schedule. So... Uh, although I do, I do break off of that sometimes, but today and is probably not the example for that. Uh, John chapter 14, we're going to pick up in verse 7. And as I was looking at this passage again the other day, Jesus directly interacts uh, with uh, Philip back in chapter 12. Then we see him interacting uh, with Simon, with Peter. Then, then, then there's some, some interaction, of course, with Judas. And... Uh, not much is going on with with any of the any of the other guys here, um, and Thomas, of course, in in last week's passage. So he interacts with four of the twelve on a, on a name by name basis, and and we we get a glimpse in, into who these men are. Uh, but all of that notwithstanding, the, the probably actually the more the most important question that anybody could be asked, or that you could ask anybody, is who is this man Jesus? He makes some, some uh, as usual, some, some pretty strong assertions about himself in today's passage. And I say as usual because whenever Jesus is talking, he's either directly uh, making some things that just really ticks the crowd off, or, or he's indirectly making inferences there that they understand exactly what it is he's saying. For instance, one that just comes to mind is, uh, Jesus said, I am that I am. And you remember that the crowd took up stones to kill him. Because they understood what Jesus wanted them to understand. Jesus was inferring his deity. He said, before Abraham was, I am. So, you know, going back at that time, uh, 2,000 years prior to the life of, uh, that he lived in, there in that first century, he was referring back to a time 2,000 years previous, 2,000 B.C. And uh, he's saying, before that time even happened, I was already present tense. So that's kind of a... Before Abraham was, I am. Um, but the, the question today that I want to ask you guys is, who is this man named Jesus? Now I'm going to try to stick to, to my script here as much as possible because I want to get, I want to get through this and, and make a point to get you to, to thinking. The answer that you provide for that question, who is this man named Jesus, will determine your eternal destiny. That, that's why it's such an important question. Um, if you if you think he's well, see there you go. I'm gonna stick to my notes. It's important that we give this question serious consideration. A well-known Christian apologist. How many of you heard of a guy by the name of Josh McDowell? Some of you have. Yeah, uh, I, uh, he wrote the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which was the product of his own quest for the answer to this question: Who is this man Jesus? Because he went while he was a university student. He went to the historical record in an attempt to disprove the orthodox teaching about who Jesus was and ended up becoming saved and becoming a, a great 20th century and into the 21st century a Christian evangelist uh, and, a, and an apologist, uh, a person that makes a defense for the hope that's within you, hope that was in him, was within him. God's gifted him to speak before large crowds, primarily, I think, youth ministries. But uh, here's a guy that, that, as a result of his own personal studies, wrote, has written several books. And the first one, I think, that really put him on the, on the radar is a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I highly recommend that to you, those of you that are interested in, in uh, studying Christian apologetics. Uh, it's called uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. I'm sure it's still in print. It's been out probably 30 years now, maybe even a little bit longer. But he wrote a sequel to it, uh, more evidence that demands a verdict, kind of like the return of the evidence that demands a verdict. But both of those books are, are very useful resources that you can find to, to use to, in order to 
respond to your neighbors and maybe some of your family members' questions about who is this Jesus, or I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe he is who you say he is. Well, Josh McDowell, McDowell made a statement summarizing three possible answers to this question, who is this man Jesus? And it uh, goes something like this. He stated, he posed, that Jesus must either be a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Now that argument wasn't original with him. He adapted that and expanded on it. It was written, uh, actually the original argument was written by a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis. You ever heard of C.S. Lewis? A British um, theologian. Uh, here's a guy, not Fred Lewis, C.S. Lewis. Okay? Okay? He was, a, he was another atheist who set about to disprove God and found out God exists and he's a prolific writer. Uh, he's written a, a great deal of, of literature. Some of, some of the titles, I wrote a, a book called Mere Christianity, um, which is one I, I really enjoy. Uh, and if you read a book by C.S. Lewis, have a hot cup of coffee and a nice warm fire going and uh, be awake because it's going to pull you in and you're going to have to think. I recommend that kind of literature, by the way, especially by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis made, made, made the original point. This is a quote from, from his book, Mere Christianity. So this is C.S. Lewis speaking now, not me. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him in response to the question, who is Jesus? Quote, people might be prone to say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. You ever heard that? Yeah? But I don't accept his claim to be God. People say that. That is one thing we must not say. A man who, has, who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus, that's why when you mention Jesus in the public square... Seldom do you walk away without having experienced some kind of an overt reaction. Jesus is a name that is polarizing. He is the lightning rod. He is the lightning. So you mention Jesus and you tell people you, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You just made yourself either a target or a great friend. So the question still stands. Who is Jesus? Well, note that I did not ask you who Jesus is to you. You see, the meaning of Scripture is not what it means to you. Jesus is not who he is to you. Okay? I only asked you, who is Jesus? It matters not who he is to you if you're wrong about who he is. Once you're right about who he is, then you can tell me about who he is to you. But if I ask you who Jesus is, you need to give a clear, scriptural, biblical response to that question. Not some warm, fuzzy response that he just makes you feel good about life. He may do that, but... Brethren, Jesus is a whole lot more than that. The question about who Jesus is remains the one question that each of us need answer. And there are several common answers that are prevalent in our society. And I've just got, I think I've got four of them, maybe five of them here. One, and this is kind of a rehearsal of that quote from C.S. Lewis. One, and you've got your worksheet here. He's a fake and a fraud. Some people say that about Christ. 
I did it one time. Some people, if you ask them who Jesus is, and they say, and they'll usually politely say, you know, I, I'm really not sure. And then you could say, well, you know, he's my Savior, he's my Lord, I love him so much, he's my best friend. And then when you push them a little bit, they'll come back and uh, often, not that often, I'm found, in, at least in the United States yet, um, you'll, but it's not that infrequent anymore. You'll find somebody that would say, he's a fake. He never existed. It's a figment of historical imagination. And again, that book by um, Josh McDowell will help you with that because he goes back to original uh, resources, back to resources that were available when Christ was still walking this earth. He goes back to 1st, 2nd, 3rd century documents that are widely accepted down through the ages and still common today. So some people would say Jesus is a fake and a fraud and, uh, and that he, in other words, that Jesus made claims that he himself knew weren't true. Well, others might say that he's a moral teacher. He's a religious, a great religious leader. But there's a problem with this option. If Jesus was a moral, just a moral teacher and religious leader, because he is certainly those things. But if that's all he was, then his claims about himself must be brought into consideration. Right? He clearly asserted his divinity. Do you understand that? Jesus didn't go around saying, when they said to him, Jesus, who are you? He didn't say, oh, I'm a great moral teacher and a religious leader. He did not equivocate about his, about his person at all. So therefore, Jesus must be who he said he was unless he was mistaken. Now, if he was mistaken, and you think he's a moral teacher or a religious leader, and he's mistaken, then he must be considered a poor teacher. Because all through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the testimony of Acts, and all of the epistles uh, refer to Jesus, and they hold him in, in a much higher level than just a moral teacher or a religious leader. Do they not? I mean, the New Testament is clear on this. There's no ambiguity at, at all. So if Jesus was mistaken, he must be considered a poor teacher, yet the record of Scripture doesn't present him that way. So if he is a poor teacher or a moral leader, if he's a poor teacher or a poor moral leader, then you shouldn't follow him. He's just another name in history who made some bold claims, had a following, made a splash, a little bit of color in the pan, and then when his life is over, it's gone, and we move on to the next guy that jumps up and says, follow me, I'm God. And history is replete with men and women that have put themselves in that position. Is it not? Even in our own times, we see these things happening. Here's another one. He is a prophet of God. But not divine. Well, who says that? Well, some Jews will recognize that he is a prophet. I'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, Islam recognizes Jesus as a prophet. Are you aware of that? Hinduism recognizes that Jesus is a prophet, etc. Many others. But we've got a problem with this one too. Why? Biblical prophets don't lie. So if you're basing your theology on this book, then you have to go with what this book says. And in the Old Testament, if a prophet said something and it proved to be a lie, or if it was, if it was a prophetic utterance, like something that, an eschatological implication, something is going to happen, and it didn't come to pass, you remember the penalty for that, don't you? You get a phone call in the middle of your preaching sermon. <laughs> The problem was worse than even a phone call. It was death. Okay? See, I weave it in. I just make it fit. It's okay. It's all right. See, Jesus said he was the I am. And there are several other cases too. But he indicated his deity when he said that. Therefore, he must be divine. He must be a true prophet. Here's another one. Some people might say, well, he's the son of God. See, we go from, well, he's a prophet. Now... There are people that say he is the son of God. Well, well, 
but not fully divine. Not in the sense that Orthodox Christians hold him to be fully divine. And I'll talk about Orthodox Christians here in just a second. That's the opinion of many contemporary heretical teachers' teachings, such as Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and there's others. But those two just kind of boil right to the top. I've dealt extensively with Mormons. They're in my family. Did you know that I'm a distant relative of Brigham Young? Who isn't? He had a lot of kids. <laughs> there you go. Right? You know, when you have, when you have 20 or 30 wives and 500 or 600 kids running around, I mean, bingo, there you are. And I'm from, a, my hometown's only about 80 miles from where Joseph Smith was born and raised, so we're kinfolk. All right? But do you understand that Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't recognize Him as being the pre-incarnate, always in existence, God, God, Jehovah God. And there's, there's other nuances there, but I'm not going to go into them now, that should have been uh, elicited an amen there. That's okay. Uh, Jesus did not, again, He did not equivocate about His deity. Here's the final one. So we have that Jesus said, uh, or people might say he's a fake and a fraud. Some people might say he's a moral teacher, a religious leader. Others might say he's a prophet of God, but he's not God. Others say, well, he's the son of God, but not divine. Like, like, like there's God the Father, and then there's like sub-gods. Okay? Do you understand that? Mormons teach this. Uh, as God is, man once was. Right? And as man is... No, yeah, as man is, God once was, and as, as God is, man might become. It's kind of tricky. Do you catch that? So if you live a perfect, sinless life, guess what? You can become a God, create your own universe, your own people, and all of, that's what they teach. So ultimately, you have to get back to the beginning of time, and they never go there. They just keep rolling the clock back in perpetuity and never get to the one that said, let there be. And yet the scripture says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and we beheld Him, His glory, that of the only begotten Son of God. And you go back to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so in the beginning was the Word making all the world, and Paul writes, I think it's in Philippians, that He holds everything together. So He's the Creator. When the beginning began, He was there. He's the one that said, let there be. I don't understand all of that, but I believe that's... I believe it because that's what the Bible teaches. Besides, if I could figure God out, really wouldn't be much of a God, would he? I know my mind. It's pretty finite. It's really finite. Okay, I mean really. The more I study, the more I realize you're not all that. And the bigger God gets. So he's either a fake and a fraud. He's a moral teacher, religious leader. He's a prophet of God, but not divine. He's a son of God, but not fully divine. Here's the last one. He is God incarnate. He is fully human and He's fully divine. He's God. He is who He says He is. That's, that can be the only option. Now this view represents the position held here's, a $20, here's today's $20 word by Orthodox Christians. Okay, now all Orthodox mean I'm using Orthodox with a little o. Okay? It just means Christians who are mainline, okay? And they came to this conclusion at a church council. Don't you love church business meetings? They had a church business meeting in a town called Nicaea in A.D. 325. And there were 318 pastors from all over the known world that were gathered there. Because there had been a lot of discussion for two or a couple of centuries, three centuries following the death of Christ about who he was. And remember, they had the Old Testament, the New Testament had been written. They were working out which books are in, which books are out. And, and once they got them all boiled down, they were trying to figure out, okay, now who is this Jesus? Because there are people out there that are saying... Well, he's not really God. He's like a sub-God. Or he's part God, part man. So he's some kind of a hybrid. And yet, 
the scripture doesn't teach that. It teaches something far more complex. You know what scares me? Is that theologians that feel like they have to have it all together so they contrive an answer that appeases the human intellect. I would rather leave a mystery be the mystery. Jesus is all God. Jesus is all man. Simultaneously coexisting in the same person. In the same body. I don't understand that. And that's why after spending three years with him, these 12 guys sitting there in the upper room didn't get it either. And they wouldn't get it. For decades. I bet they didn't really get it until they died and were taken into the Lord's presence and they went, I get it now. I bet there's a lot... You know, the, the, the New Testament talks about the mystery of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a mystery, Paul wrote. So great, the Lord solved that mystery. But you know what he gave us? A whole lot more mysteries. I mean, the deeper I dig into God's word, the more questions I have when I chase after an answer in scripture. I find the answer and then I go, but what about this? What about that? What about that? What about that? What about that? So I'm now I'm just like my kids were and just like my grandkids were. All I do is walk around and ask him, God, Why? 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 And I learned how to s stop saying to God, yeah, I know. That's the other thing kids say, right? Right? Now, my kids never did that. <laughs> Present company excluded. God, Jesus is God incarnate. He's fully human. He's fully divine. And this view was, it was summarized and adopted officially by the known church, 318 of them. There was no prevalent church then. It was churches that were scattered all over the, the known world. And these guys came, theologians came from all over the Mediterranean. They came from Italy, they came some from Spain, they came from Macedonia, which is Greece, they came from present day Turkey, Turkey. they came from uh, the Holy Land, they came from Jerusalem, they came from northern Africa. Some of them probably came from as far away as India because the gospel had been all the way over there. They came from all over the world to sit here and to hammer this out. And that's the decision they came to. Jesus was exactly who they said, who he said he was. And guess what? Today, this is still, and I know there's a schism between Protestants and Catholics, but it is still the, the teaching that's held by Roman and Orthodox Catholicism, Greek and Russian and Romans, and those of us from a, a Protestant background. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus was who he said he was. And there's no exception on that. And, and let me just mark, let me bookmark this, okay? If you're wrong on who Jesus is, everything else is tainted with error. When somebody comes knocking at your door and they hand you something, hi, I'm with the watchtower, okay? Be kind to them. I mean, don't get out a flamethrower and set them, you know, just set them on fire as they're heading down the road. Be kind to them. Try to share the gospel with them. But know this. Know this. Here, here's, here's a good question you can ask them. Who do you say Jesus is? When a couple of young men with nice suits show up and they've got little name tags here and it says elder so and so on them, okay? And they come knocking on your door. Be kind to them. Perchance you'd have the opportunity to share the hope that you have in Christ with them. But ask them, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say Jesus is? And continue to press them until they, until they actually spit it out. And you're going to find that their understanding of who Jesus is is nothing like you've ever heard in this church. Matter of fact, their opinion of who Jesus is is almost, well, he's just a, a superman. He's much more human. Because cults bring God down to our level. They make God more palatable. They make him reachable. And number two, they refuse to recognize their own need for a holy savior. That's what sin does. Now the only problem presented by this last position that God, that Jesus is God incarnate, that he's human, fully human and fully, fully divine, 
is that you cannot, there is no way, unless you're born again, you'll understand that. It's impossible. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians that the natural man, in other words, the man that's using his, his own psychology, his own personal intellect, is absolutely incapable of understanding this truth. Incapable. When you come to Jesus, you have to come with no presuppositions other than, one, you need a Savior. Two, He's the one. And then all these blanks get filled in. You know, the disciples, the apostles, they didn't know who Jesus was until the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. You remember the story in Matthew, in Matthew 16? And I'll quote it to you. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, let me give you the timeline where this is. This is as far north as you can go. It's the northernmost extension of Jesus' public ministry. There's no record of him having gone farther north than that. It's, look, we have maps. It's way up here. Way up here on the north side of, the, of Galilee. I mean, it's way up there. So they're up there at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus is there. The, uh, the uh, transfer, the, um, um, somebody help me here. Transfiguration took place there right around this same time. And it's from this high point in Christ's ministry that he begins to head south towards Jerusalem. It eventually leads us to John 14 here in the upper room. But at this point, Jesus asked, uh, there he is in the district of Caesarea Philippi. He began asking his disciples saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah. That one's a stretch. I don't know why they would say Jeremiah because there's no intimation in Old Testament Scripture that Jeremiah was coming back. Okay? Or one of the other prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? The most important Scripture, the most important question rather, in all of eternity for each one of us is, is who do you say Jesus is? And Jesus poses it right here. To the twelve. And you've got to love Simon Peter. Spits it right out. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, you didn't figure this out because you're a sharp cookie, Pete. You're not. As a matter of fact, Pete, in case you haven't noticed, you are not the sharpest pencil in the box. You're a brick short of a full load. Your ladder doesn't go all the way to the top. Pete, the Father has revealed this to you. That's what he says here. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven... That was all introduction. John 14, 7. And we'll actually go through these verses rather quickly. And I'm going to interject some words there that are either in other translations or they're implied. Or they're grammatical that you don't pick up in, in, in whatever translation you have. So I'm in John 14, 7. Here we are, the upper room. Jesus has talked to them about not letting their heart be troubled. He's told them he's going away. Judas is gone. He's out in the night plotting, doing whatever he's getting ready to do. Peter has already been confronted with the fact that he's going to betray Jesus. He's kind of sitting back going, what's that all about? Thomas has already indicated that his faith isn't quite all that deep, even though he's in the inner circle. I mean, he's there with the twelve. And then Philip pipes up. Well, Jesus says here in verse 7, If you had known me, I like NIV adds a word there, if you had really known me, and it, it should be there, if you had really known me, you would have known my Father also. So Jesus here is showing them how shallow their theology is. They get Jesus, but they don't understand that he and the Father are working together in this. They don't see it yet. They will. 
If you had really known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now watch Philip. Philip says, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Hmm. You know, a little background on Philip. Philip is the one that brought Nathaniel to Jesus. Way back in John chapter 1. He'd been there right from the early on. He was one of the first one of the disciples that followed Jesus that Jesus called out. And, and he's the one that, that told Jesus that it would be impossible. Remember when Jesus was feeding the multitudes? Philip's the one that, that uh, told Jesus it would be impossible to feed the multitude. Even with a half a year's wages. It would be impossible. And you remember that story when Jesus fed the multitude in both times, right? Two times? He had more left over than there was when they began. By the way, those of you that had Thanksgiving dinner, did you have more leftovers than you did? At the end, then you had when you started. If you said yes, you're not listening to my question. <laughs> okay? Because if you were where I was, that turkey didn't know what hit it. Okay? But when you hang out with Jesus, there's always more left over than there is than when you begin. Who among you is worse off now than you were when you first started following Jesus? Anybody in here? You see, you give Jesus nothing. We come to him with nothing, right? And He gives us everything. Amen. We came empty handed. And we look at our lives now. And we go well Lord you've blessed me with this. You've blessed me with that. You've blessed me with this. And I'm not just talking about stuff here. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about peace of mind. I'm talking about confidence in the face of adversity. Which we didn't have coming to Christ. So we come with nothing. And He feeds the multitudes. In each one of our lives. Does He not? Isn't he wonderful? Philip's the one that, by the way, said, that's impossible. You can't do that. Philip also is the one that leads us into this, this whole upper room that this last week. There in, in uh, John chapter 12, when the Greeks come, they want an audience with Jesus. And Philip, because he has a Greek name, it's inferred that maybe they felt more comfortable with him. They were Greek Jews. They were Hellenized Jews. Okay? And so they may be related with Philip more, more. And so Philip is the one that went to Jesus. So we see him down there as kind of being one in there working with Christ. All right? But here he voices a fundamental human longing. To see God. To see God. Don't you want to see God? I do. On one hand. And on the other hand, I know me. I don't think, well, I know that in and of myself, I couldn't bear to see God. Because when I see God, He sees me. And there's some stuff about me that nobody in here knows. But God knows. And some things that I'm ashamed of. But God knows. But I have a Savior. And so all those things are separated as far as the east is from the west. They're cast into a sea of forgetfulness. And as the story goes, Jesus has posted a sign there that says no fishing. So I want to see God. If you're not born again, you should shudder in fear. Lest you see God before you're ready. You remember the story in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. I was going to go there and read, but obviously my my side notes that aren't in my notes have taken longer than I expected in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah the prophet the prophet Isaiah saw God and fell on his face I mean and and the scriptures are are full of examples where people have just seen angels not even God and they've fallen on their face there's something about the holiness of God we don't get we don't understand the difference between ourselves and the holiness of God it's a much farther much broader gap than any of us could even possibly imagine and Jesus spans that gap he's not a teacher religious leader are you kidding me he's God verse 9 Jesus says to Philip now watch this here have I been and those of you from Texas okay you ready for this have I been so long with all y'all? It's plural there. Okay? And yet you, Philip, it's singular. So he's talking to Philip, 
but he's, it's, it's almost as, as if he's saying, have I been so long with all you all, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? This is the man Jesus speaking here. I can only imagine what his heart must have felt like just then. I've been with you three years. You've watched me raise people from the dead. One of them was dead four days. And you still don't know who I am? Huh. There's some other rabbits here. I think they're in the notes. So they don't qualify, do they? Huh. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Do you catch that? If you know Jesus, you know the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. John 14, 9. To receive Jesus is to receive the Father. Mark 9, 37. To honor Jesus is to honor the Father. John 5, 23. To believe Jesus is to believe the Father. John 12, 44. I notice I put the blank there, but I left the answer in. <laughs> well, I knew I wasn't dealing with the sharp end of the stick here. Yeah, okay. To hate Jesus, though, is to hate the Father. So those people that hate Jesus, they hate the Father. What is Jesus saying here? Have I been so long with all you all, and yet you, Philip, don't know who I am? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. How could you say, show us the Father? You've seen Him. Verse 10, do you, singular, Philip, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to all y'all, it's plural again, okay? I do not speak on my own initiative. This is, you know what he's saying here? He's saying, hey, I'm not making this stuff up. This is what the Father tells me to say. In other places, Scripture says that Jesus only speaks the words that He hears the Father saying. He only does the things that He sees the Father doing. That's Jesus. He says, but the Father abiding in me does His works. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on account of the works themselves. NIV there uses the word miracles. The actual word is works. But Jesus here is referring back to, and he did several times, he told the Pharisees, at least three or four times that I found, he said, you know, if you don't believe me, believe me on the basis of what you just saw me do. How could they be disbelieving after they'd seen him stand there, after weeping, wiping the tears out of his eyes, after he had just said, Lazarus, come forth, how could they still be opposed to him? Talk about a hardened heart. And yet, so many people choose that way. So let's review just some very basic questions about today's scripture. Number one, number one, who is Jesus? Who is he? Not who is he to you? That question, I used to use it all the time in Bible study, just to kind of stimulate a Bible study. What's this passage mean to you? Not a good question. Because you could have ten people in the classroom say, what does this passage mean to you? And get ten different answers. You know, truth is kind of exclusive. Only one of those answers maybe is right. They might all be wrong. Okay, But if you've got five answers to a question, only one of them, or ten, or whatever, there can only be one truth. Truth is exclusive. It excludes everything else. So it's not who is Jesus to you, it's who is Jesus. That's the important question here. I just kind of wrote my answer here. 
because uh, it's my notes and I'm preaching. I can do that. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Great Shepherd. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the soon and coming King, the Head of the Church, the Lamb of God. He's my Lord and Savior. And you could go on and on and on and on and on with words that describe who He is. But that's who He is to me based on what the Scripture says who He is. Here's another question. Why do you believe Jesus is who you claim him to be. <coughs> See, you're thinking. I like that. Here's my answer. He's proven himself to me time and again through answered prayer, through his indwelling presence, through his voice in the inner man, through the, this is another $20 word, the efficacy of his scripture. In other words, the ability of God's Word to do exactly what it says it's going to do. He's proven Himself to me. He has come through so many times when I thought, ain't no way you're going to pull this one off. Now I just relax. I really, I'm more relaxed than I've ever been. I'm hyper than I've ever been because I realize that time is no longer my friend. <laughs> As if it ever was. But God's been faithful to me. And here's another question. Have you always believed this? You ever run into somebody and you ask him, uh, uh, do you know Jesus? And they go, well, I'm a Christian. Right? And they'll say, really? Well, why are you a Christian? Well, I was born in America. You ever heard that? No. <laughs> Some of you have said it. I used to say that. I used to believe that. Well, I'm a, I'm a descendant of revolutionary war warriors, fighters, direct descendant of both my mom's and my dad's side. They were here in 1627 on my mom's side and 1636 or whatever on my dad's side. And they probably should have run us out and had us all tarred and feathered before we got our roots set down. But I felt like that somehow breeding gave me some kind of a right to claim myself as being a Christian. But I haven't always believed he was who I just described him as being. Because I had no idea. I was like Peter. Except the Father hadn't revealed anything to me. Who do you say that the Christ is? Well, I'm a Christian. I was born in America. <laughs> Have you always believed this? My other answer? That he's the Son of God, the Messiah? Here's my answer. Absolutely not. I haven't always believed what I believe today about Christ. I, I, I have progressed, I have grown from believing I was a Christian because I was born in America. That's where I started. And then I made a stellar advance when I made a claim and I said, I'm an atheist, there is no God. At that point, God began to deal with me. There's a scriptural principle behind that. Jesus is talking to the lukewarm church of Laodicea. He says, I can't do anything with you guys. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were on fire for me or absolutely opposed to me. I wish you were hot or cold. But since you are not willing to make up your mind, I can't have anything to do with you. And when I got to where I said, there is no God, God said, okay, game on. Ding, the bell rang and we both came out and he knocked me out. <laughs> I used to say I was a Christian because I was born in America. I went from that to being an atheist to being a seeker. An atheist and yet totally at odds with myself and everybody around me knowing that I wasn't right, that there had to be more to life. I began to ask questions. I argued with that poor man that led me to Christ. We worked together for six months. Every single time he brought up Jesus, I'd argue with him. And he just kept coming back at me because he loved me. <laughs> Eventually, I became a Christian. How? I confessed Jesus as my Lord. And I believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9 and 10. 
could I have passed a theological exam back then when I got born again? No, I'm having a hard time passing them now. But I knew I needed a Savior. I knew I was upside down. I knew that my ledger, my sin ledger, the red ink far outweighed anything that went to the good. Not that that's the standard for salvation because it sure, certainly isn't. A lot of people are fooled into thinking they can work their ways into heaven. But I was at least wise enough when I was confronted with my own sinful nature to know that there was nothing I could do to span this gap, to get right with God. Do you, do you not understand, I hope you do, the wonderful grace that we've been given. We can come into God's presence totally unworthy in and of ourselves. Do you understand that? Do you get that? I mean, when, when you come to grips with who Jesus is, you know what the backside of that is? You come to grips with who you are. And if both of those two occasions don't bring you to tears for different reasons, come to grips with who Jesus is and look at yourself in, his, in the mirror of His Holy Spirit. And let Him break your heart. And when it's open, and it's bleeding there all wide open and defenseless, you know what He'll do? Read Jeremiah 31, 32. He's going to write His law on your heart. He'll change you from the inside out. And you'll begin to want to do the things that God wants you to do.